Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. The Senate is preparing for the impeachment trial of former President Trump on allegations that he incited the mob on January 6th at the Capitol. But President Trump is not the only person who faces potential accountability. Questions still remain over how the massive U.S. national security state allowed the mob to happen. Well, joining me now is Bill Arkin. He is a veteran reporter who has written a dozen books on national security issues, and he has been covering the violence at the mob for Newsweek magazine. Bill Arkin, welcome to Pushback. Thanks for having me on, Aaron. So you actually wrote a piece two days before the mob attack uh, for Newsweek called Threat of Pro-Trump Violence in Washington Overshadows Inauguration Security Plans. From what you gathered from your reporting, what was the sense uh, from law enforcement officials about what was going to happen and their level of preparation? Well, there were multiple things going on over the weekend uh, before the Wednesday, January 6th inter- insurrection. First of all, there was a lot of finger pointing, which to me as a reporter always tells me that they're in absolute disarray. A finger pointing from the FBI at the Department of Homeland Security for being irrelevant and partisan and unready. A finger pointing from the military to uh, the DC government, which I thought was really odd, but there was a sort of uh, almost racist put down of the DC government that somehow they weren't ready when in fact they turned out to be the most ready of all. Uh, Everybody was pointing at the US Capitol Police and uh, questioning whether or not they weren't politically partisan, uh, that the Senate side of uh, the the US Capitol Police under the Sergeant at Arms, the Senate Sergeant at Arms, uh, wasn't beholden to the Republicans and that with 138 members of the House side of uh, this, the, the Congress, that uh, even on the House side, though there was a Democratic majority, that the U.S. Capitol Police was compromised. So you had all of this finger pointing, and to me, it it just smelled of something uh, uh, really in disarray. And also at the same time, people were saying that they anticipated that there would be violence as a result of the so-called Save America rally. And um, uh, so so it's funny, I wrote that article on the Sunday before the Wednesday insurrection. And um, essentially I got a lot of pushback from people both inside the government and even from other reporters who said that I was exaggerating. What did they tell you? Well, you know, there's a tendency in times like this to have a lot of feel good rhetoric and the feel good rhetoric is supposed to wash away all of the problems and inequities and 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 uh, incompetence and even uh, cravenness of the US government. Um, we've seen it now post-insurrection where everyone is applauding the U.S. Capitol Police and saying that this is not our country, that this what happened was anomalous. Um, and I think that that Washington tendency, that, that tendency to uh, want to make things better by just rhetorically claiming that they're better, that somehow I was exaggerating when this was exactly what I was hearing from officials who were able to speak, speak candidly to me, not, not, not people who were um, spokespersons, but people who were, who were able to speak candidly, um, that that said to me that everyone was willing to and ready to criticize and blame Donald Trump, but that no one was really ready to look more closely at the actual protesters who were coming to Washington, D.C. in droves uh, and ask the question both, who were they, what did they want, and uh, what was it possible that they might do? So what do you think, if it's possible to answer this at this point, is was the main structural problem here? 
the FBI was tracking at least some of the people who were planning on coming to DC. There are reports that FBI agents even visited people at their homes and told them not to come. So how did that awareness not translate into action? Well, there I have one I have one specific that I thought was very compelling in the reporting that I did. I have been tracking homeland security uh, very closely for the past year, particularly because of their irrelevance, if you will, in coronavirus. And um, I, I'd obtained thousands, about 5,000 uh, threat reports that the Department of Homeland Security had distributed to their state and local partners uh, in the two years preceding um, the end of the Trump administration. And in those two years of threat reports, there were an awful lot of reports about Antifa and, and, and be clear about white supremacists as well, about a whole variety of so-called domestic violent extremists. But one thing I never saw, didn't see, and now I've put all of these documents into a database and I can search through them by uh, words, was the term Trump supporters or even Trump. So it's like reporting on the domestic situation in America while at the same time not acknowledging that both Donald Trump is the instigator and, and the uh, promoter of a certain kind of uh, violence, a certain kind of protest. Uh, but more importantly, as January 6th came around, uh, it, there was no reporting as far as I could tell from inside the Department of Homeland Security or as far as I can tell from really the FBI, that specifically said that the threat was Donald Trump's militia, that the threat was Donald Trump's army. And why that's important is that I think that the law enforcement and Homeland Security authorities can hide behind um, individual cases. They can hide behind we're looking very closely at the Proud Boys or we're looking very closely at this specific group and, and kind of avoid the big picture. Now, you know, big picture, right? Connecting the dots. I mean, we were supposed to have solved this as a result of 9-11 two decades ago. But clearly on January 6th, though the FBI at the local field office level might have been following certain people. And in fact, they made arrests. And while they might have been impeding certain people from traveling to DC, and now we know that they even were able to confiscate some weapons, et cetera, et cetera. When 100,000 people showed up on the mall at the ellipse to listen to Donald Trump, and then when thousands began showing up at the Capitol building in the morning, I don't think that anyone really had a big picture view, and I don't think that there was really anyone in charge. And so that's the second problem. We have this Department of Homeland Security that was set up after 9-11 to sort of fill in the seams, fill in the domestic seams of counterterrorism, fill in the domestic seams of uh, closing down the borders and making airline safety and in airline travel safer. Um, and over the years, it's, it's taken on so many missions, um, getting deeply involved in, in law enforcement and deeply involved in matters that have really nothing to do with counterterrorism, uh, that it's diluted uh, its, its central role, the reason why it was created uh, while at the same time kind of making itself irrelevant. So even though the Department of Homeland Security now has more law enforcement officers than the FBI does, even though the Department of Homeland Security has grown, doubled in budget from 30 to $60 billion plus, and even though it's one of the largest federal departments of the US government, third, 
only the Pentagon and the Department of Veteran, Veteran Affairs are larger. Uh, if we didn't have a Department of Homeland Security, we wouldn't have to reinvent it. Uh, it really is overlapping with the roles and responsibilities of the Department of Justice. It's overlapping with the roles and responsibilities of the Pentagon. And the agencies of the Department of Homeland Security that actually work, uh, the semi-autonomous agencies of the Department of Homeland Security, the Coast Guard, the US Secret Service, and to some degree FEMA, uh, they don't need the Department of Homeland Security. And in fact, they have to ca carry out their job despite the Department of Homeland Security. The only Department of Homeland Security organization that was present at the Capitol on the morning of January 6th was the Secret Service. And they were there because they were first and foremost primarily responsible for Michael Pence's security but they were also there because they were uh, ready in case there had been a, a, some kind of a continuity emergency. Uh, and as the day went on, as FBI and um, US Marshals and ATF agents, all of whom belonged to the Department of Justice showed up. And finally the FBI showed up in force at around 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security was still absent and basically was invisible. And, uh, you know, that's just, that, that's just not acceptable. And um, um, when people say that they want to abolish ICE or they want to abolish the Department of Homeland Security, I would certainly hope that one of the outcomes of this day would be that we would look more closely at both what Homeland Security does and whether we need it. Um, the, de the Department of Justice through the FBI is primarily responsible for domestic terrorism. And uh, the FBI has questions that it needs to answer as well. But I think because there is this split and that the Department of Homeland Security has taken on the responsibility of being the liaison between the federal government and the local authorities, it's diluted the ability of the FBI to do its job. And so we have fantastic dysfunction. Uh, the District of Columbia is not a state. And so as a result of it not being a state, the mayor of the District of Columbia is not in charge of her own National Guard. And that's another problem. And it's a structural problem. And it's an inequity for a city that is still majority Black. And all of these things came together on um, January 6th, but here's the most important thing that came together. Everyone in the federal government and the national security apparatus felt like they could not state that Donald Trump was the threat, that they could not state that Donald Trump's supporters were the threat that to distribute such a report, to make such a threat assessment, so risked the possibility that Donald Trump would activate the military or bring the guard under his control or even declare martial law, that in their efforts to stop Donald Trump from creating an insurrection, they created an insurrection and that they were profoundly unready. And by the time it was clear that there were no outer barricades at the Capitol building to actually protect the building from tens and then hundreds of thousands, well, a hundred thousand protesters, it was too late. But we can look at it structurally, we can look at it politically, uh, and, uh, and it's clear uh, that this day didn't have to unfold the way that it did. Things didn't have to happen the way that they did. And I, for one, am not happy with the idea that we're just going to paper it all over with an impeachment trial of the president and with a lot of happy words about moving forward and think that somehow we either resolved all of these uh, structural problems inside the District of Columbia or we've resolved the threat that exists from this still residual Donald Trump army, which is out there in America and is far more omnipresent and far more powerful 
than those in DC give it credit with being. I want to challenge one thing you said. I find it very plausible that fear of political retaliation from Trump and his minions prevented an accurate assessment of the threat posed by his supporters. As you mentioned in your reporting, you obtained more than 5,000 reports under the umbrella of the Department of Homeland Security that did not mention Trump supporters. And I presume they also didn't mention the make, make America great again, right? Correct. Yeah. But then the idea that the fear of that, then that gave rise to the insurrection itself I'm not sure I buy that because there's got to be a way to still warn of, you know, a lot of people amassing and they have uh, potential weapons and they've, they're a part of a certain right wing movement. And that creates a security threat, which requires a certain number of, of police forces. I don't, I'm not sure if we can blame that fear for creating the insurrection because there's got to be, if you're, if you're worried about an insurrection and you're worried about a movement, there's, there's got to be a way to, to warn about it and to mobilize some forces to confront it. Well, I wouldn't disagree with you, Aaron. There is a way, but the record shows that even when the chief of the Capitol Police, Stephen Sund, said to his supervisors, the Senate and House Sergeant at Arms, that he wanted to put the DC National Guard on ready, their response before January 6th was to say, oh, well, you can do it, but can you do it quietly and offline and not ask the White House? So we have enough evidence to now show that specific decisions were made that were derived from this fear of the president. And so you're right. They could have had contingency plans in their back pocket. They could have had forces on alert. They could have even had the Capitol Police and riot gear and ready just in case. And none of those things happened. But the reason why none of those things happened was that they were afraid of Donald Trump. And that really is the bigger conclusion that I draw. Now, what, what might have happened? I'm not disagreeing with you. But I just think that the truth is it didn't happen. And, and there are many questions that are raised. The two that I find most compelling that we need to answer as a society is first, uh, whether there wasn't some level of collusion between the police and the protesters, which is to say, whether there wasn't sympathy on the part of the protesters that, uh, that this, that this um, a protest was legitimate and that even their marching on the Capitol was legitimate. Um, and then second, that, you know, was it the case that because they were a mostly white crowd, that they were handled with kid gloves, really in contrast to uh, Black uh, Lives Matter and other protesters that have been of the left. And the reason why it's important uh, is because uh, I, I think that, again, to circle around to the role that Donald Trump played, it was intrinsically because they were a, right, a white crowd, a white right-wing crowd, uh, that again, to label them a threat, uh, ran the risk of having uh, Donald Trump retaliate, firing the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, uh, firing other officials. Um, he'd done it already since the election. And the three primary national security officials, the Attorney General, the Secretary of Defense, and the Secretary of Homeland Security were all acting uh, officials, meaning that they hadn't been confirmed by the Senate. Uh, two of them had barely been on the job a few weeks and hardly had even met all of their subordinates. And so this was real. So even though we have these lingering questions that I'm sure will be answered in the many investigations that are going to now unfold, um, it all circles back to the same thing, which is to call this particular crowd anything other than 
the the label of domestic violent extremists or even white supremacists without connecting them to Donald Trump was really the only official um, choice on the part of the federal government. Did they have contingency plans to deal with rioting? Yes. Should they have been ready uh, to move much quicker? Yes. Should they have had a better perimeter defense at the Capitol and been ready for a riot, even if they didn't think it was going to come? Yes. But these are the kind of government incompetences and government problems that we always see, and we have particularly seen become more extreme under the Donald Trump presidency. But I am not optimistic that as we move forward that somehow these problems that are exacerbated by the fact that the District of Columbia is not a state, that are exacerbated by the fact that there is this interloper Department of Homeland Security that is unnecessary and redundant and thereby incompetent, uh, that are exacerbated by the fact that Capitol Hill is the sovereign territory of the Congress. And so therefore, if the Congress is split, uh, there can be no security. Um, these things all contributed as well, and I don't particularly see any move in the Biden administration to really change them. I, I don't see any appetite within the Biden administration, for instance, to uh, eliminate the Department of Homeland Security, let alone even reform it in a significant way. Well, this is where I think the Biden Obama camp actually has some responsibility that although I totally think that Trump incited the mob and certainly your argument that fear of Trump and Trump's just control of the government prevented an honest and appropriate response to, to the mob and the planning for the protests. I think that you have to also go, go back and look at the Obama administration where they issued a report in 2009 warning of the threat of right-wing white extremism. And after some criticism, they retracted the report and apologized specifically to veterans uh, because veterans were named in the report as being part of the problem. And lo and behold, we had at the Stop the Steal uh, mob attack, a lot of veterans, including uh, the woman who was shot. So that's where I guess I'm, I'm, I'm pointing to where, where I think while Trump's role here is massive, I just worry about the singular focus on that might overshadow areas where both parties are complicit. Well, I would certainly not excuse the Obama administration. Um, and it seems to me that uh, when one looks at the uh, entire fabric of threat reporting, which has emerged uh, in the last few years as, as, as the white supremacy movement has uh, gained strength because of Donald Trump or under Donald Trump. Uh, I don't necessarily see a um, reluctance on the part of the FBI and uh, uh, ICE and uh, other law enforcers not to pay attention to white supremacists as part of their jobs. I just don't see a, a national effort on the part of us, uh, of society, uh, to understand who these people are and where they're coming from and what their grievances are and even to understand why it is that 70 million people voted for Donald Trump. So that's not resolvable by the federal government. Uh, that, that's, that's a task that we have in front of us because uh, these people are not going away. And as for the military, well, there's so many contradictions in our society. I mean, this is the most respected institution in the United States, consistently polls as being the most respected institution. And yet it is increasingly uh, a, a smaller and smaller segment of American society. And this problem that we've had uh, of the military really not being able to police its own people so you have an institution where people join up and they're stripped down in basic training to be fully indoctrinated into the ways of the military. They sign away their right to privacy. 
They have to get security clearances and they have to comply with rules of behavior and decorum that are unique to the military and unknown in the civilian world. And yet still dozens, if not scores of military people, both on active duty in the National Guard and veterans are shown again and again and again to be sympathetic to ISIS, sympathetic to uh, foreign terrorists, uh, themselves racial, racially um, bigoted and even violent, uh, sympathetic to white supremacist movements, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's like, okay, I have to at some point say to the Pentagon, get your shit together. You, you have to be able to vet your own people because if this is going to be the army that's going to protect us, then I want to make sure that the people who are in that army are uh, truly upholding the constitution and truly uh, believing in the chain of command. And, and, and what we've seen, not just from January 6th, from the insurrection, how many veterans were involved, but what we've seen in the past year, how many arrests have been made of uh, former military people and even taking say for instance, the events at Fort Hood, Texas, uh, how rotten the military is at some level internally. Uh, we, we don't have the stomach in our society to, to look at it more closely. And I'm afraid that now that we've once again appointed a retired general to be the secretary of defense, which I oppose regardless of how brilliant the guy might be, or, uh, we don't have civilian leadership that's overseeing the military, and that in some way dilutes our oversight and our control, and it dilutes our democracy. Let me put one thing to you in terms of how we understand or fail to understand Trump supporters. There are certainly, I think, people inside the Trump camp that where I think Hillary Clinton was right to call them deplorables, just irredeemable racists. That is obviously a contingent on the Trump side. I think it's hard, it's impossible to deny that. But then you have people who I think embrace Trump as this radical answer to a failed system, a system that has failed them, taken away their jobs, sent them overseas to fight in these awful wars. And Trump portrayed himself as the one who was going to drain the swamp, which of course was a con. But then instead of Democrats responding to Trump's election with some policies that could sway those people, including many people who actually voted for Barack Obama, which was a contingent of Trump voters, a sizable one, you had Democrats basically try to undo Trump's victory, in my opinion, via the Russia investigation. And I'm not sure how closely you followed it. It's something I've, I've covered very closely, and which I think was baseless, and which I do think was an attempt to uh, undo Trump's victory using the intelligence agency. So I'm wondering your thoughts on that. And if you, if you think that for us to truly have some growth and to take some lessons and to move forward and try to repair the damage of the Trump era, if that is something as a way of reaching out to Trump supporters, uh, if, if that is something worth undertaking and looking at. Well, first of all, I, I was working at NBC News during that 2015 and 2016 period, was one of the primary investigators uh, working on the elections and Russian interference. And I've never believed that uh, there was any kind of direct Donald Trump uh, involvement with the Russians. Um, and I've always thought that the media's focus on the Russia investigation, the dossier, the, the, the dozens of books that have now been published that basically all say nothing <laughs> was wrong. And I left NBC uh, in January 2019 and wrote a scathing letter to that effect that we we're lost in the Donald Trump circus and we're derelict in our duty as reporters to cover the world as it was, and particularly that we were not covering perpetual war. Having said all of that, 
I'd give a little pushback to you, Aaron, as to who these people are. And of course, first I would say they're not one thing. Even at the Capitol on Wednesday, January 6th, they weren't one thing. There were a lot of hangers on, there were a lot of people from fringes of other conspiracies. Uh, there were a lot of people who just were part of a mob that became more and more emboldened as the violence increased. Um, but, you know, I live in Southern California. And though I'm a veteran of living in New York and Washington, D.C., and I know what that bubble feels like, here in Southern California, uh, when I talk to people, uh, what I see is people who are confused about what they should think about the American government. But they don't think that they uh, have good leadership at the top, that they don't believe what the government says, that they don't feel like security ever increases, that they feel that there are these grotesque inequities of wealth uh, lodged in the hands of fewer and fewer people. And all of those things swim around in a, in a much broader uh, anti-government uh, opposition and anti-government feeling that we've seen play out in coronavirus um, that I just don't think, again, is all Donald Trump's doing. I, I, I think it's, it's the case that uh, there are a lot of people in America who uh, don't like the way America is, and I would include even people on the left in that category. And yet, when we don't have strong leadership at the top, and when we don't have common purpose, and when we have um, institutions that don't do their jobs, and when we allow the federal government to be incompetent, and we allow the federal government to uh, get away with uh, making the same mistake over and over again. And then finally, when we in the news media give voice to so-called national security and law enforcement experts who were the very architects of failure. So every, almost every one of those guys, and they're mostly guys who we see on TV telling us how national security should be, are the architects of 9-11, and they're the architects of endless war, and they're the architects of failed strategies in Afghanistan and Iraq, and now we give them a platform to tell us how things should be, and we hire them as the Secretary of Defense. I mean, I'm sorry. There's probably not an American alive who's outside of the Pentagon or outside of the Washington bubble who could tell you why it is that Lloyd Austin, the retired general who's been appointed the Secretary of Defense, deserves to have that job. What did he do? What battle did he win in Afghanistan? What magnificent uh, leadership did he exert that was any different than any other general? And the answer is none. He just happens to be a friend of Joe Biden. And Joe Biden feels comfortable with him and thereby found him to be a person who would neutralize negative response if Joe Biden had actually chosen a Secretary of Defense who was more liberal or more peace oriented or more anti military, uh, and in anti military, I mean willing to take on the military. And Joe Biden obviously made the choice, just as Barack Obama did, that he needed to neutralize the national security opposition in order to get a broader agenda accomplished. That's how powerful the military and veteran class in our society is. So I, I, overall, we're so divided in our nation and much of it falls back to national security and homeland security and what is the actual threat to America that I'm afraid uh, that that division, which was not invented by Donald Trump and was not invented by Barack Obama. Uh, and in some ways you could say that Barack Obama bent over backwards as much to uh, be politically correct uh, as Donald Trump bent over backwards to be politically incorrect. Uh, but the product of 
of the last 12 years uh, is, is that our society is divided and sick, literally sick. And, um, and I just don't see the leadership that's going to pull us out of this. Um, I, I really don't. And I think that while people might have been disgusted uh, with what happened on January 6th, here's what I hear more. We shouldn't be surprised because these people are so awful. So they actually use the crowd of protesters and the mob on January 6th as kind of a surrogate for Donald Trump. We shouldn't have been surprised that they're so awful. And I think the danger of that and why I give you pushback on this point, Aaron, is that it pretends that because Donald Trump is now gone, that somehow they're gonna go away too. We'll leave it there, Bill Arkin. Bill Arkin is a veteran national security reporter. We'll link to his pieces at Newsweek covering the Capitol mob attack. He's also the author of a dozen books on national security issues. Bill Arkin, thanks very much. Thanks for having me on, Aaron.